summit is the Cybersecurity Risk Management and Security. Uh, my name is Carsten Klein. And to start with, when we talk about uh, cybersecurity, for most people, what comes up to their mind is really to be attacked, to, to be involved in, in hacking, and how to protect against it. But cybersecurity is more, it's, it's a part really for corporations, but also for for government uh, governments to uh, really create government structures, risk management, set up policies, uh, standards, and, and uh, procedures. And while those government structure, you can manage cybersecurity risk. So just many of you uh, may be familiar with this one. This is actually the uh, CIA uh, trial and it uh, represents the, for uh, info security and information security really the, the three uh, parts that are important. One is uh, confidentiality, that's really your data have to be kept uh, safe as mentioned also now with uh, privacy and, and uh, personal data so you really have to ensure that none of your data is actually leaked. That can be either from, from inside the company accidentally somebody forwards uh, in an email or from, from outside. The, the second one is the in integrity key. That's really when you have databases or any uh, data collections that the data is, is protected and is not altered. And that's also a very important part for, for your data. Uh, because if you imagine, for example, you have an uh, atomic power plant and somebody uh, alters your data that are important for, for the process of the plant and that will affect very badly the, the plant actually. And availability, uh, that's very important uh, really to ensure that data is at all time or in timely manner available. And that's also many uh, threats actually that's out there. They, compromise one of the three uh, aspects, actually. So, to, uh, to just give you a quick overview, there are basically four major uh, frameworks are being available. There are many companies that use either one or a combination of, of a few of them. And uh, here we have, we have, for example, the ISO 27001, which is uh, can uh, get certified for this one. This is the uh, International Organization for Standardization. Uh, they're based in, in Switzerland and they uh, uh, created the framework together with the industry how companies actually um, create those uh, governments. Then we have uh, the, the National Institute of Standard Technology Cyber Security uh, NIST, uh, the, the framework. Uh, that's the more American standard that was created uh, with this expert. And that's initially it was for, for US and also for more for government and uh, critical infrastructure, but now it's also adapted across the industries and also uh, across the world. And then we have two other uh, standards. One of them, the last one, is uh, important actually for um, any business that does uh, payments with credit cards or debit, debit cards. So if you're in a, in a payment business, then you normally go for, for two of them. So this one is, is a must then in that case. And then that covers really how to handle information related to, to transactions. And that's irrelevant how many transactions you have or, or how, many, uh, how large your organization is. So that, Let's go quickly into the uh, NIST cyber, cyber security framework. So just to give you an idea of the, the framework and, and the governance. So when we see we have identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Those five items actually, if you just think of on a very high level. So identify is really to identify your, your assets, your information assets. Because many companies are actually not aware of what assets they have. They, they run the operation and when, when they get asked by regulators or, or they, they have an incident, 
they just realize then that their information, actually a very valuable information, is spread across the company, copied multiple times, and it's not secure. Uh, or, in opposite way, companies try to protect all of their information. So, then protect is really, your, your assets you have have to be protected, and then any um, uh, attack or frauds have to be uh, detected, and then you have to respond, so how you respond to an attack. So, most people kind of concentrate on those ones, detect and respond. That's when, when you talk to, to companies, the first things come up, yes, we have to Im improve our uh, firewalls, our, our uh, detection systems, and then you respond to, to any attack and fight back. But there's also the recovery, actually. So in the recovery stages, once you got attacked, how to uh, fix something or reverse something. And that often comes back to your recovery plan to, to backups, to, uh, depending on the threat you have. So just to go a little bit more into details here, Sean. So for, for the identified, that's where really your, your governance structure is included. You have your risk assessment. So risk assessment, once you know your assets, then you identify how risky is your operation, how risky is how you handle them, and you come up with an assessment. And you go through, you try to put the price tag on it. So you say, okay, if I lose that data, how much does it cost me? And you put in, you put on a uh, likelihood. So that's the, the very basic behind it. And then you take a decision on this one. Once you have done your risk assessment, you come up with a strategy. And there you prioritize your risk and you say, basically, do I want to accept that risk? Let's say the risk was, it's, let's say, 1 million yen. But to mitigate this risk would cost you 5 million. And it happens only every 10 years. So, depending on your other risks, you might say, yes, I accept this risk. I put extra money away and then pay if I have to. But you have to take into account also the different risk uh, uh, factors actually. So some of the risk is really like the price tag where it costs you money. Some of that might be your reputation. And so your reputation can bring down all to your business. So, but yeah, so you come up with a risk management strategy and, and there you decide, do I accept this risk? Do I mitigate this risk? Do I outsource the risk? And yeah, those are the, the areas really what you do. Then for the protection, that's when you go through again. So you know really what's, what, what are your assets, but then you have to make sure you have controls in place. So who has access to this data? Uh, do people in your company are all aware of this data, the, the importance of this data? How, so you have to do awareness and, and training to, to all your stuff because they, they handle those data. Then you have the actual data security, uh, the protection, maintenance, and the technology. So you have those parts. Then you have, in a, on the detection side, there you have really technology, softwares, like also presented, where you really detect any uh, abnormalities. And in a response, really, one is your response plan. So you try to forecast any scenarios that can happen and by forecasting uh, them you already prepare for. So if you know you, you get, um, like you have an attack, somebody gets into your system and your data gets uh, compromised, how do, how do you react on it? And that really goes into your response plan, um, also how to uh, maybe shut down certain parts of your business, but then still you continue with your critical business areas or you move to a, a standby side. And so you do analysis and then, yeah, look for improvement. And then your recovery plan, really. So if you could really compromise how to recover from this one. So how to go and get backups, how to uh, reverse certain actions, or um, yeah, how to move on like a, like a BCP plan, basically. And, and 
how it how to reverse this one. So I think those ones are really the part of the for companies and like it's it's both I saw it's mainly the non-financial companies that normally are not really in, into the whole uh, structured approach. So and then so so you have companies, for example, medical companies of you know, hospitals. Uh, they are very high tech, but I mean, when have you like when you been last time to the hospital? You saw probably some equipment that runs runs still on Windows XP or earlier versions, and it's not bad actually if you think of if it is a standalone application, but also because for the hospital itself it might not be possible to fix that because the equipment maybe has not uh, an, an updated patch for uh, a later version of Windows. So the equipment, which maybe cost millions of dollars, US dollars, might not run anymore. So they have to be, but it has to be all put in your policies and, and has to be recognized in, in your risk. So unless you have that one, uh, you, you cannot deal with it. But other interesting part is also startup companies. You see many, um, for example, cryptocurrency exchanges who started off like very fast at the beginning, they really concentrated on a technology. They came up really with brilliant uh, ways to, to introduce cryptocurrencies to a really wide market. But then they didn't have any uh, framework in place. And then when we saw the news, basically it was quite sad. Often they got attacked and it was like, yes, crypto exchanges are not safe, it's, it's terrible, and, and all the new technology. But it often came back just to very basic operational errors or, or there were no policies, no protection in place. So it came back really to very simple things, or even there was no training. And uh, so in this case, I think now the, the current uh, Cryptocurrency uh, exchanges and companies, they know very well aware of that. But there will be the next wave of new companies. I mean, now looking at AI companies, a lot of data is involved, often very uh, personal and private data. How is that one actually handled? In many ways, it's handled like in, in an academic sense where people gather this data, do really brilliant research, but then yeah, maybe somebody cannot walk off with a USB stick full of those, those data. So now moving on to the next one. This is an overview actually how, um, like now in a, in a digital interconnected world, how we have the, the relation. And that often goes quite far. So you can see, I, I really encourage you to look at the World Economic Forum. They have that one. And you can click actually on a, on a different links and you see how it builds up. So you see from uh, cyber war to cyber crime, uh, law and uh, like technology and law, and all the outer ones. It's like you have nuclear security, you have like international security, you have uh, countries, space uh, technology. So it comes from, it's not that easy anymore. And if we get even more involved, like now with space technology, we see uh, the, the latest trend, like to have like thousands of satellites circling around. And it's, we have a lot of information out there and we have a lot of different devices. And the difference is really, years back when we saw we had IBM or we had companies uh, that were uh, uh, sponsored by the states, like, like I mean by the governments, uh, uh, governments. So it took all this time until it came into the private sector. So by the time it came into the private sector, the new technology, there were already standards in place and uh, it was all well researched. But now the private sector actually is quite leading in most uh, industries. I mean, still the government's also leading by it. But it's now, we are in a very, very fast uh, phase actually of development. And we, we're losing, I think, sometimes track and also the, the gap actually for companies to cope with it, it, it's really getting bigger. Because imagine you like a mid-sized company, or like a small company, you have 50 people, 
uh, most likely you outsource your, your IT or your, your databases like you use AWS, Azure, whatever. You set it up, you think, yeah, I'm very safe, I have it now in the cloud, uh, it's all taken care of, like, so my fallback solution, if, if it gets corrupted, I still have a backup there and everything is fine. So people don't, they, they fully rely on this technology. But then you saw many incidents actually happen where the settings were wrong. And then people, like it was basically that the public had access to private databases because even the technology is really advanced, let's say from AWS, but if you have the wrong settings when you do it and you don't have the knowledge how to set it up properly, you, you can make mistakes and you give access to, to everybody basically to, uh, for, for your database. So those, or like if you see now the, uh, like tailor blocking or, or um, bring your own device, people have so many different devices, like each company, they have now not only a laptop anymore for their employees or desktop, they have no laptop, desktop, they have probably uh, some, some iPads, some, some phones, and they have a, a TV in a conference room, which is basically an IoT device. They have like some, some uh, automatic hoovers going to the office who map out your office space and film everything. But nobody is aware of it. Everybody access, every device access your, your network. So, yeah, this one. So, now to come to the part with the, the hackers and threats, which is normally what, what is more exciting often. So the, the four categories really from, from people that threaten you is like, one is cyber criminal. So cyber criminals is really on, on a very, like it became very common now. Because before, let's say you had, let's say, pity crime or, or, or drug dealers or, or like this who, who make money. Right now you can basically download uh, some software to to uh, attack or, or, or to, to, to stage phishing attacks or other things. Uh, you can download those software and they are very easy to modify and you can start your own attacks. So, so the entry level for, for even um, really low uh, skilled IT people who maybe had just a course at school or like this, it's already there to, to act as a cyber criminal. So it's not anymore like um, a guy who has like four PhDs and, and is, is like a freak sitting the whole day like with this coke and you know, red bull in front of the, the screen. It can be now everybody in your neighborhood basically. Then we have uh, hacktivists. Those are really people taking very strong views on, on their um, political or, or like other uh, orientations and they attack companies, they attack governments. So they do it more for ideological reasons. And you have state-sponsored attacks. Those are, um, goes more back for years actually, we saw it like it was in, in Iran, the, the, the nuclear plant actually, when, when that was hacked and there was an incident. Um, so that was the, the first one when it really, I think, started of, of, of like, uh, no, like knowledgeable to a wider view, uh, where you had state-sponsored uh, attacks, but now, let's say North Korea is, is very active uh, to, to do it, but it's, it's like all the countries in the world basically do it to each other. And the risk is really, if you have those attacks, yes, it might be just to sponsor North Korea that they get over the winter and that they get some money from, from those attacks. But it might be also, uh, you can get attacked, your, your infrastructure get attacked, your, your whole uh, country gets, um, yeah, you bring down, that they can cause uh, large economic losses by, by uh, maybe cutting off the water supply, the, the transportation, communication. And if you do that for like just one or two weeks, uh, each country will lose a lot of money. Uh, and then insider threats. Insider threats is often people think, oh, I have like an uh, espionage, I have some spies in my company who sends uh, data to competitors or, or something. It's not really always the case. It's insider threats can be also an employee who suddenly gets angry and is upset and, and maybe 
send something to your, your clients or competitors or uh, an, an employee who copies your, your database for his own, like client database for his own purpose, maybe wants to move on to the next company. Uh, but it could be also the employee who sends accidentally an email to the wrong address. Let's say it comes back to the privacy data, where let's say you do an attachment, you work maybe for the government, uh, you attach some, some important documents, you send it and then you realize it went to, to the wrong address and then you have, have an incident. And, but all those ones come also back to, to your framework, to, to your risk framework. Because if you have policies in place and, and training and awareness, your staff is aware of that one. And, and they, they might not be able to avoid it, but at least they can recognize it and then they can take action on that one. And, and so some of the threats that are at the moment worldwide still very active, the one which was mentioned already, the, the phishing, phishing attacks is um, uh, very common still. Also, it's many, like a lot of information is really now very easily available on the internet. You can go to, to LinkedIn, you can go to, to Facebook and you find really very personal data from, from uh, people which you can use then to do uh, customized uh, phishing basically. So if you say, okay, that takes quite a long time actually to go through that effort, but then you can use like open source intelligence tool like MyTech, for example, where you basically put in uh, like usernames or, or like uh, names and then you have it in a graphical way. It shows you all the relation, all the information of different, like from, from Twitter to, to LinkedIn to, to Facebook, but also anything which is mentioned on, on, on Google or, or web pages, and you can extract that from. And that was very quick, actually. You can do it in a work approach, and then you can really do very good phishing uh, attacks. With that. And phishing attacks, uh, attacks still work, actually. It's, it's uh, amazing. If you do it, well, people are very uh, busy, they, they get an email, looks like, from Google or, or Microsoft, and they click on it, put in their details, and that's it. Then, um, internal threats, we have already mentioned a little bit, so it can be either uh, like somebody who wants to do harm to the company, or like uh, somebody inside your company who do it more like an incident, like uh, unintentional. But uh, those are your, your insider threats. They are also still quite high. Um, then you have ransomware. We saw many of the ransomware attacks. That's uh, very lucrative, particularly when you think of you do it in a combination with uh, cryptocurrency, because in the past it was much more difficult. So if you ask for, for some reward, some money, how do I get that money actually? How do I get it safe without being bought? Now with uh, cryptocurrencies, you can do it much more easily actually. And you can, if you target a wide audience and tell them to, to send you uh, a certain amount in certain cryptocurrencies, you, you can do that quite nicely. And it's, it's done really, it's done by uh, cyber criminals, but it's also done by state-sponsored attacks actually. Uh, then mobile devices. We also mentioned already, so that the number of mobile devices really exploded and also the, the security on the mobile devices, it's not in par really to, to your laptop or your desktop. So if you think of, let's say you have Office 365 on, on your, on your uh, uh, desktop in the office, it's normally quite well secured actually. But then at the same time people have it on their mobile phone. So on a mobile phone, it's also quite secure, that's why your, your password and, and, and login, but still you do not have exactly the same control as if you have it on, on a uh, like desktop or laptop, just in the corporate environment. But then it's also, people again have a more light um, approach, if there are some new apps, they, and some, like say, you get a PDF reader, and they say, can I access your, your address book, can I access your GPS location, and people just click yes and you ask yourself why would they do that, but it's, people do actually, that gives information away. Um, other one is also, when people have mobile devices and they work off-site, it's often secured 
areas are very difficult to, to find people work from Starbucks, where it officially says it's not a secured uh, network or Wi-Fi, but they, they use those, those ones. So to, to get compromises is much more easy there. Or even chargers, for example. If you charge your mobile phone, sometimes you have the option to plug it in, into some other devices. So don't do this with your uh, own charger. Then you have cloud security. I mentioned already that it's very safe, but also on the other hand, you have to know what you do. So you have to know, like you have to have the expert there really, or you have to get some help. Um, then IoT devices, 5G, is really the whole part. The, the, the standards, like most IoT devices, they don't follow exact standards. So if you buy, for example, a radio, like an old one or a telephone or whatever, it's all approved by some uh, standard commission, so they, they uh, sign off that it doesn't interfere with other radio waves or, or whatever, and that it is safe. With many of the IoT devices, you don't have it. So if I buy, for example, a security camera, I don't know where this information goes to. And so I can have something, a uh, security camera, a Hoover, I can have a TV with this camera, and I have no idea where the, the information is shared with. And so, particularly for the corporate environment, but also private environment, uh, a, a big point. But think of it is even when, when we think about uh, driverless cars, for example, autonomous uh, 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 driving, you have also the issues there. You really rely on IoT devices, and you basically trust that they don't get compromised or, or that something happens. 5G is big in the news always. Um, yes, it's faster, it's, it's more, more options, but it's, I think it, it's also really, because you have the, the underlying hardware, the, the network that gets implemented, is now really the, the foundation for, for many years to come. So, so you have really the software updates on top then. So now people are very nervous about this foundation, that there are no backdoors in there like from, from the hardware side, or who to trust. And that comes also back with the whole approach for what it was fine to buy any maker for, for a laptop or whatever. But recently it got kind of, you know, who to trust. So it comes back. Uh, it's like, and you see it often in the news, uh, people want to actually access, like to, to like through a backdoor, like to your iPhone, so like this for governments. So that might be like a, like a digit. Uh, approach if it pro uh, if it prevents crime or helps to, to fight crime, but then once you give that access, it's also accessible probably to many other governments, but also to to uh, yeah uh, criminals. Deep fake. Uh, you probably saw that even I have a German accent, so there was that case. It was the energy company it was uh, end of last year. So the, the office in the UK got a call from the, the CFO and they, they were sure it was the CFO was the strong German accent and he called up and he said, oh, please transfer, I think it was 200,000 uh, euros over to the Hungarian account of that uh, uh, company. So the, the uh, British entity, they, they done that because they really believed by the conversation that was the, the CFO from, from the headquarters they transferred the money, and then afterwards the, the CFO uh, called up, thanked them, and then he said, "Ah, oh, we will send some the funding over to to the UK to uh, to make it even." And but then short after he asked for another transfer, and then they got suspicious, so they, they followed up. Uh, so it comes back actually they broke their, their protocol because normally it should have been like an official email with with follow ups and in particular those. Uh, amount of money, so they broke the protocol because they were they saw it as the CFO and they have to act quick on it. But it comes back; it was a deep fake, so it was basically a software. Somebody uh, used basically just the, the voice from the CFO, so they, they used the program to mimic that voice, and people really uh, went for it. And uh, sometimes it's, it's difficult, and you probably all saw those 
YouTube videos where, where people kind of uh, take on roles like uh, also you showed like this um, uh, uh, Bruce Willis like as a joke, but now there's many uh, videos around where, where it looks quite realistic. So give it another few years and it looks really realistic. So that's another one. Um, yeah, in uh, AI, AI and uh, machine learning. Yeah, in one point it's connected to deep fake, but there's also the other ones is releasing of the. Right now, if I attack somebody, I can as as a hacker, I attack for a while, and then at one point I might give up on this one. So I, I try to to continue with my attacks, but. As long as the, the company can defend themselves, then that's okay. But imagine if I use like, um, like machine learning and I attack 1,000 similar companies and I watch how they react and then I use that information to attack back those ones. So I learn basically on the strategies very fast how people respond, but then I use that one to attack back so my chance to actually succeed is very high now. And I can go on basically yeah, forever, theoretically. And so in this case, if your defense me mechanism is not based in a, like in, in a similar way, we don't want to say it a similar way because it sounds like AI fighting AI, AI, AI but then you won't have basically, like, like your chance is quite low to defend yourself. So it, if you attack a wide range of people, you, you take the information how they defend themselves, you learn from it, and then you attack back again and again until you, you succeed. So that's the AI part. And then security in real time, that comes back really to, to events where you have some very important decisions. For example, like we have uh, Olympics uh, coming up or the, the election, and there's basically, you have information has to be available at that time and also it has to be secure. So in the case of the election, for example, if there's some, some mix-up in, in that place, it will really affect the results and it's very hard later to, to do something. Or like in Olympics, if you, if for example the infrastructure goes down during the Olympics, it, it will be a big impact. So, and so what are the, the, the uh, tech trends for like, the, the driving uh, cyber security. So one is really I my thing would be really the smart cities because smart cities we using basically only the whole scale of, of IoT devices. We, we are linked together and uh, it's it's to the full scale actually we, we are using. And in that case we really have to protect. Uh, all those information that is exchanged, but also we have to protect ourselves, like even physically, like so. And the other trend for Japan, I would see, for example, digitization. So Japan is still going through the digitization. So once there's more information digitized, then also the need for cyber security will go up even more because there's more of the important assets in digital form out there, and. So I, I think those those are really the, the ones. Uh, other ones I probably mentioned already during the, the talk. Thank you very much.